here's a great story. It comes to us from the Torah and from the Old Testament. It's the story of a wife and a son exiled. Abraham's second wife, Hagar, and her son Ishmael sent into the desert. And they travel for days and days and days, and they suddenly find themselves at a moment having no idea where they are. No map, no guide, no food, no water, no shelter. It is a moment of absolute, utter despair. And Ishmael collapses to the ground. And the mother, Hagar, does the unthinkable. She moves away from her son. And in the text, we are told, she says, something like, Let me not look upon him as he dies. Right? It's, it's, it's all too much. It's too much. We all have moments like this when it is absolutely too much. I can't handle it. I can't stay here. I can't take it anymore. It is too much. I am done. Let me not look upon him as he dies. She moves away from her son. And in that moment, the angel of God appears and essentially says to Hagar something like, don't worry about your son. God sees him where he is. He's going to make him the leader of a great people. And then says the following, Hahaziki et yadek bo, which usually gets translated as something like go and lift your son and go and reach your son or go and touch your son. But actually, the original translation is much closer to the following Strengthen yourself through him. Strengthen yourself through him. Hagar moves over goes to reach out to her son, and as soon as she does that, she sees behind him the well, the well of sustenance, the well of life. Now no one, no rabbinic scholar or Christian scholar, believes that this is a miracle story where God poofs the well into existence at that moment. The understanding is that the well was already always there, but in her despair, she couldn't see it. And this is true for any of us. Under stress, we cannot see. But what was it that enabled her to see? It was that moment of connection with her son. When we connect, we find a way. When we surround ourselves by those who love and care for us, we find a way to move forward, to move through, to actually enhance our life so that it flourishes, even in the presence of stress, in the presence of suffering. My name is Maria Sirwa. I'm an inspirational speaker and a clinical psychologist. And I'm here this morning just for a little bit to talk to you about the notion of the choir or of connection and how it helps sustain our sense of resiliency in the presence of unexpected change or trauma or suffering. The choir, the, the notion of the choir, comes to us from every arena of wellness that we can look at. We know, we know this intuitively and we now know this by research, that connection makes a difference. We know that married people live longer. We know that children who are facing terminal illness do better if we can connect them to other children who are experiencing the same kind of thing. We know that those of us who are participants in faith groups, church, temple, mosque, synagogue, um, practice systems, yoga centers, for example, meditation centers, if we are connected to centers that are spiritually based for us, we tend to have fewer illnesses, we tend to have fewer complications put in surgery. We tend to live longer. We know, for example, that women with multiple sclerosis symptoms who are connected in volunteer efforts have fewer experiences of pain, have less stress related to their diagnosis, and actually live longer. We could go on and on and on. Wherever we look in terms of in the world of wellness or illness or the, the idea of reducing stress, we often find that this very notion is a sustaining notion. When we are connected, we do better. When we are connected, we see, which means we can think and act in ways that are much more life-enhancing for us in the presence of that stress. Now, it begs the question, of course, who is the choir for us, right? Who is in our lives right now, at this very moment, who can support us in whatever our journey is, whether it's a journey of stress or a journey of wellness, whether we're moving toward uh, finding a way through something difficult or just enhancing the thriving energy that we already have. Who is here for us today? Who is our choir? And I'd like to su suggest to you something a little bit radical. Your choir may not be the people you actually live with. They may not be 
your family of origin. It may not be those who you spend the most time with, the people you work with or you see every single day. Your choir may be someone you met on the subway years ago who turned to you in an odd, unpredictable moment and gave you a word, an image, a phrase that this to this day sustains you. It may be the guys that you go whitewater rafting with every four years who you've known since you were 12 years old. It may be a poet from centuries ago, Rumi, Rilke, Kabir, who lifts your spirit to such a degree that you know that you are not alone in the world and that you too can move forward now just as they did. Our choir may be someone right here in front of us who we have forgotten, who loves us dearly, and who is there to support us. Here's how Clarissa Pink Ola Este says it. Everyone deserves at least one person who, when we call, sings the Alleluia Chorus. Who in your life right now is singing the Alleluia Chorus? What I invite you to do is take a breath, take a moment, and consider this question. Who is your choir today? And just allow the names or the images to come. Try not to edit yourself. Try not to think about what other people would say who your support system is. You know best who your choir is. It's important also to remember that we don't need a posse. We don't need to be the most popular person in the club or the community or the neighborhood or the school system. What we need is one or two people who we can rely on when the dark times come, or who can cheerlead us forward when we're ready to take that next step to our transformation. Once you've identified your choir, what's important to do then is actually go and sing with your choir, which means to actually make the connection, make the phone call, send the email, get together, somehow drink from that well, in the same way that Hagar moved toward her son, we actually have to go toward the choir and sing there in order for it to be energizing for us. Here's something also very interesting. In the world of personal transformation, in the world of building resiliency and strengthening ourselves, many of us know exactly what we need to do. We know exactly what the next step is. We're very clear about it. The problem comes in in terms of finding the courage to actually take that step, to move forward. And most of us have been raised to believe that the antidote to fear, which is what actually gets in the way of courage, that we are afraid. The antidote to fear has something to do with will, that we can, we can will ourselves forward into the next step. We can, if, we, if, we just, if we just gather our energy and move forward. Actually, what we understand is this, that the antidote to fear is connection. As soon as we don't feel alone in the journey, we find that capacity to take that next step. If any of you are struggling with this notion of courage right now, take heart, because the possibility for amplifying that strength is right there in front of you, and it simply has to do with remembering who is there for you in the world. Now sometimes, sometimes, we actually can't think of anyone today, right? And that may mean that our greatest choir is not in body right now. It may be someone who is an ancestor, or someone we've never met, or someone who passed on a long time ago. Or it may be that we are in transition. Shams knew this. Shams was the teacher of the poet Rumi. And evidently from the get-go he was a bit of an odd duck and his parents literally didn't know whether to send him to the monastery or to the village of idiots. And he himself knew that he was different. And one day he had an epiphany about who he was and the story is told that he takes his parents down to the edge of the water, he points to the land and says, this is where you belong. And then sweeps his arm across the water and says, this is where I must go. And he leaves knowing that he will never return the same again. He has a much larger destiny in front of him. A brave, brave, remarkable choice. And as he swam in those waters, he found along the way those beings who were there to support him on his journey, eventually finding his greatest student of all, 
the poet Rumi. Right? Along the way, who knows what sea creatures and sea birds came to escort him on the journey, whose teachings came to him as he moved into distant lands, what students he found that eventually would bring him to the place that was truly his, to the work that was truly his. Keep in mind that there are those who are ready to swim with us as we move along. So if you are in a moment where you may not know exactly who is in your choir, it is quite possible that you are yourself in transition from the land into the waters that are far more nourishing. I wish you well in that journey. May your choir come to you clearly. May you find the capacity to reach out toward them. And together, may you discover that land. Strengthen yourself through each other. Thank you.